Hey guys, before this video starts, I would just like to ask you to please subscribe. It's free, it really helps me out, and you can unsubscribe at any time in the future. The Legend of Zelda. Some would call it their favorite game series. Some would even call it the best series of titles ever created in the gaming industry. From the over-the-top fighting and Hyrule Warriors, to the rich and tragic story of Majora's Mask, and even the 2D masterpiece that is A Link to the Past. Everyone who has picked up a Zelda game can easily identify their favorite. And before we get started, I want to hear from you guys. What is your favorite Legend of Zelda game and why? Also, this won't be a ranking in order. I just wanted to shed some light on these fantastic Zelda games. And yes, all Zelda games are great. Some are just greater. In my opinion, there's no like bad Zelda game. Unless you're talking about the CDI games, they will not be on this list, because they're just horrible. Not all Zelda games are created equal. Sure, the biggest sellers like Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild are more likely than not the favorites among the community. But let's step down from the podium, look at the bottom of the food chain, and revisit the Zelda series' top 5 most underrated Zelda games. So for number 1 on the list, I have... The Adventure of Link, or more commonly known as Zelda 2, if that's how you know it. Um, now, my co-host actually over on Those Two Guys is absolutely obsessed with this game. He swears it is the greatest 2D Zelda game ever made, and it's his absolute favorite game on the original Nintendo game console. I do understand why he loves it. It's those exact reasons that he loves it that most people actually don't like it. Let me explain. Zelda 2 is super difficult. The combat is not top down like every other 2D game in the series. It is a side scrolling bullet hell that has you jumping and ducking and blocking your way through a level like a football fan trying to get to the bathroom at halftime. This is where the game does shine in its uniqueness though. The side scrolling nature allowed the up and down access of Link's movement to allow him to jump and duck, which makes a lot of cool combos in sword fighting. And as far as I know, no other games have really focused on 2D that much. There was a little bit in Link's Awakening and a little bit in the Four Swords games, but like he can jump, jump in this game. Like he is moving around. Like even in the 3D games, he doesn't really jump. Like look at these Link jumps. He is a world class athlete. Even the rocks, feather, and cape can't match this. He is crazy in this game. Now the story for Zelda 2 does create plot holes in a way for the overarching series if you care about that. Like there's a really weird thing where there's technically two Zeldas now because you saved her in the first one but then she's been asleep in the second one for a long time and it, it, it gets really messy. But other than that, Zelda 2, fun items, fun experience if you want it, but it's just going to take its place as one of the most underrated Zeldas ever. Now, for number two, I'm putting a bit of a torn one. I don't feel like many people enjoyed it or even played it the first time around it was released. Back in 2011, the Wii was popping off and the motion controls were all over the system for like Wii Sports and all these other games. And gone were the days of butt mashing. We got our fancy new motion controls and we could break our wrist instead. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm talking about Skyward Sword. Now, yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, I love playing that game on my Switch, it's so fun and cool. That's a problem. People didn't even care about it for almost a decade until it came out on a new console and they just threw a new coat of paint on it. Skyward Sword is kind of like the Phantom Menace of Zelda games. Everyone loves it in hindsight, but it has some major flaws. First of all, Jar Jar... Oh, sorry. I meant Fee or Fi, however we pronounce her name. The ghost sword lady who serves as your companion for the quest. Kind of like Navi, but a little bit more annoying in my opinion. Now, admittedly, I did cry the first time I played this game when Fi decided to go away forever and that sad heart music started playing and oh my god, it's so sad. <sighs> oh, sorry, nostalgia hit me. Now, Skyward Sword is pretty mid-tier for its story. The dungeons later into the game get better, most notably the Ancient Cistern and its amazing boss that everyone seems to love. It's even ranked as one of the best boss fights ever. The items are mostly forgettable besides their recurring ones. 
the whip is all right, I guess. It's kind of used for that boss fight that everyone's talking about. The sprint mechanic was new for Zelda at the time, but it was kind of the building blocks for the stamina in Breath of the Wild, so I won't hate on it too much since it wasn't a horrible system. And it wasn't like it was overly used. Most of the time you could just find those little plants that let you sprint for longer anyway, scattered around perfectly. The Silent Realm in Skyward Sword is probably the best part about it, though it does seem very, very scary for first time players and is actually almost like a horror game when you mess up and those big flying robots start coming after you. But overall, Skyward Sword is pretty forgettable the first time around and only really serves as like a missing piece of the lore nerds in the timeline. But I did buy it twice on two platforms, so I guess it's alright. Also, the Zelda from this game is one of the best, so that's pretty neat. For our third entry on the list, I'm going to kinda cheat, and that's because I'm lumping the Four Swords games together. Four Swords and Four Swords Adventures are just... How do I put this nicely? Kinda horrible. And yes, I know I'm supposed to be talking about why these games are underrated, and not why everyone hates them, and I am kind of breaking the rule, because not all Zelda games are bad, but they're all great, but none of them are supposed to be bad, but these ones are like bad in a different way. They're supposed to be cooperative, but they aren't really. Okay. Okay. So basically, the only thing this game has for it is its multiplayer, and the gameplay is super unique in the sense of how you're moving around the screen. What I mean is, the game is played through LAN cables on your console, and you're all playing on Game Boy separately. This is where the fun begins. Because the DS wasn't around yet, this was kind of like how the dual screen on the DS would work. The TV would be your main screen, and the Game Boy would serve as your secondary screen. Here's an example. All four links are running around in the room of a dungeon, and one link gets knocked into the convenient pit in the middle of the room. Weirdly enough, he doesn't come back. He didn't die. He falls down, and now you're playing on the second screen separate from your friends on the GameCube. Now if everyone falls in, You'll see them again walking around all through your separate devices, but isn't that so cool to play a Zelda game together, but so independently at the same time? And yeah, these games aren't exactly friendly because you need so many cables and four people to even play for the best experience, but the idea is there. It's really cool. The game also kind of forces you guys to compete with each other at the same time. Like, some items are limited in number and the rupees aren't shared. So people can actually just sabotage the game and it turns into a really toxic mess if you don't get along. And yeah, that's that's probably why people don't like these games. Is that also why people hate Triforce Heroes? Okay, for the fourth entry on the list, I'm going to be a bit controversial. I'm pretty sure people love this game, right? I don't know. I feel like it doesn't get mentioned because the 2D games at the time were kind of bloated. It's a pretty late release for a 2D game. Either way, I'm including it because it's a sleeper hit and it's easily one of the best Zelda games. I'm of course talking about 2005's Minish Cap for the Game Boy Advance. This game is super pretty visually, even for a Game Boy game. The combat is a mix between Link's Awakening and A Link to the Past, which is probably the best 2D combat in the series for all skill levels. If you want a hard gameplay loop, go back to Zelda 2. The music is so amazing for everywhere you go in the game. The items are all really cool and unique, despite some of their one-time appearances. The Rock's Cape is definitely my favorite item from the game, and one of my favorite items of all time. And the dungeons and boss fights you use it for are just so perfect. Like, imagine being hundreds of feet above the clouds, and you're jumping between these flying stingrays and stabbing them in the eyes. Oh, it's so fun. The main gameplay feature of Minish Cap is shrinking. It's it's alright, it makes for cool puzzles and allows you to visit some interesting areas like the mini city and the rafters and bookshelf of that cafe or the main Pikori village walking around the giant logs and flowers. Though there isn't a lot of combat to be done with it so it, it kind of is just for the exploration. The only real problem I have with the game is the kinstone trading. While most of the game you get like a heart piece or rupee payouts Things you can live without, ultimately, it doesn't hurt me to miss it. But when I want to 100% a game, and there's actually a secret kinstone you have to match to get a third act area in the first act, it gets a little tedious and bothersome. And that's not all. There's a sick old man that I'm talking about. You have to save him before you go to the third act. 
if you end up going to the Sky City before saving him, he just actually dies. So if you miss out in the first two hours of the game, you'll, you can't save him. As far as I know, it's the only time-gated kinstone in the game, where if you miss the kinstone you'd have no idea about, you actually can't save this old man NPC in 100% the game for completion. But as it stands, Minish Cap is the greatest underrated Zelda game. Okay, I lied again. The rest of the list isn't ranked, but this game is absolutely an underrated gem. And to be fair, I am biased because this might be my favorite video game of the series. I don't know, but this is my video, so you gotta deal with it. Spirit Drax is the second DS installment and the second sequel to the amazing Wind Waker game. Set in the future of New Hyrule following the events of Wind Waker's ending and the game Phantom Hourglass. I hate that game. You play as, well, Link. But not the Link with the soul of the hero, but this is a new Link. And he's the newest generation, born over a hundred years after Ocarina of Time's Link. And he's just a kid through this game. Now, since this game was on the DS, this game is actually played through the stylus. You basically guide Link with your pen or finger or stylus, whatever you have in hand. It's a little jarring at first, but once you're used to it, it's a lot easier to move when you can instantly flick Link around, instead of having to use your feeble human thumbs to move around. The biggest change for the actual game would have to be the Zelda companion for the game, and not in the sense of her watching over you and just flying around and talking to you like some of the other ones. No, Zelda is a damn ghost in the game, and she possesses these giant walking juggernauts known as phantoms. They're basically invincible knights made from darkness. The only weakness Zelda has is that she's afraid of rats. <sighs> The main mode of transport outside levels and dungeons is your train. Obviously, it's kind of in the title. You have to recreate the spirit tracks throughout the story as they serve as this binding, magical thing for the Maladus, which is the big bad. The trains have different cars and upgrades, all serving purposes, and they all even have unique train whistles. Nice touch. There's a few sections in the game where you haul people and resources with your passenger train and your luggage train. It's kind of tedious, but once you find out the best routes, it's not bad. A lot of things get a lot easier when you're further into the game and unlocked more tracks. There's also these really creepy tunnels at a few points in the game where this giant monster eye crab thing chases you in the darkness. And as a child, this scared me so much to the point where I didn't play the game for months. The items are pretty standard, though the sand one was a unique and new entry at the time the game's released. The snake whip is fun for the parkour areas of the map where you have to swing around, and it's used for like grabbing these thorn things and tossing them around, so it's a nice additional ranged weapon. Oh, and you can do this really fun thing where you whip Zelda to move faster, and if you whip her enough times, she'll actually just come clock you. There's been a few times where I've died to this, just messing around. Uh, there's a few items worth mentioning besides that, but most of them are very situational. Um, most notably is the boomerang working differently in the DS games. You kind of draw a path around the top-down corners and it'll like fly around. It's kind of weird. But it is interesting for the boomerang since it's not like it used to be. This is also one of the only games where you have sword beams. Granted, it's very late in the game when you can actually start using them, but it's a nice homage to the original games, being able to shoot lasers. The bosses in this game, for the most part, are pretty good. Except for the forest bug boss, I don't even care to remember its name, like Stalnox or something. I should also mention that the intro music for all the bosses is like exactly the same, but it's like different speed, different pitch, and slightly different instruments. Also, fighting Burn, the good guy turned evil with the giant robot hand. God, he's so cool. I also cried when he died at the end. The musical instrument for this game is a pan flute, which is still a woodwind instrument, so not really different, but you can play some charming little tunes as usual. The best part about the music, actually, is when you go to each dungeon and free the sages, you play this song with them. This is cool for the first five or so temples, but it gets a little boring. But when you're sealing away the final boss, all the sages join you in song, and everyone plays together, and if you haven't seen it, please, please, please go watch that ending scene literal chills seeing all those instruments float around you and play with you is so cool 
Kind of reminds me of Link's Awakening, actually, when all the instruments play together. What else is there to say? It's just so amazing, and so many people haven't given this game a chance. Please, try to play all these games on this list, but especially try to play the last two I've talked about. Minish Cap is really, really good. Really fun all the way through if you're not trying to mess around with side quests. Some of them are just a little boring. But Spirit Tracks especially gets really good really fast. Like, really fast. And, yeah. Hey guys, before the video ends and you click away, I would like to thank you for stopping by and watching this video if you made it. Zelda Month and Zelda as a whole is really important to me, and I hope you guys found some enjoyment out of this video. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching, and it's been Donovan. Peace out.